is really my favorite time of the year as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Years ago, Kim and I went to a, we went to a, a big production, an Easter pageant production. It was at the Fox Theater, and it was spectacular. But to be honest, my favorite Easter productions are in small churches, uh, where, you know, you got shepherds that wear bathrobes, you know, instead of real robes and stuff like that. Well, I heard about this one church. They had a little girl that was going to be the angel in the Easter production, and she had one line. She was very shy. She just had one line. She was supposed to say, when the light came on, he is not here. He has risen. That's all she was saying. He is not here. He has risen. And she practiced and practiced and practiced. She had her lines down cold. Well, she wasn't expecting to get stage fright whenever she got in front of all those people. And they went through and finally they came to her little part and the light shined on her. And she goes, he, he, he gone. All right. So, <laughs> so he gone, but he's coming again. Amen. Amen. Well, let me uh, just say I'm going to give you a gift today. And it's not the gift of a short sermon, all right? It's a gift that I think you'll appreciate. I'm going to give you all a kiss. Now, some of you are like, gross, all right? Some of you are like, yes, you know, I've been waiting for that. I'm not talking about with my lips because I'll save that for my family. But what I am talking about is keep it simple. You are afraid to say it in church. I'm going to say it again. You fill in the blank. Keep it simple. All right, you said it, not me, all right? So, and I appreciate you not calling me stupid again. All right, so, um, well, you say, what do you mean by this? Well, the truth is, we make Easter complicated, don't we? Let, let, me, let me say it a different way. We make Christianity complicated. I mean, the truth is, so many people, they look at Christianity and they're confused. They think, well, this is the most important. And, and they get their little pet doctrine and they begin to talk about what this means. And if you're not, really, that's where denominations and stuff come from. They've got a couple little things that are not the main thing, but they elevate it and they don't keep it simple. But what I want to do today is I just want to keep it simple. Because everything that we celebrate, Everything that we believe, everything that we do as Christians is rooted, it is founded on one thing, and that is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Keep it simple. Sometimes the most simple things are the most important things, aren't they? I mean, the truth is, you think about something as simple as breathing. You don't normally have to tell yourself or remind yourself to breathe, do you? It's like, breathe, breathe, breathe. No, you don't. Unless you're watching a scary movie or something's happening, you are not having to remind yourself to breathe. Why? Because it's real simple. It's real basic. But without it, you can't live very long. And the same is true of the resurrection. What we want to do is answer the question, what's the big deal about Easter? And look. I realize that sometimes we celebrate the celebration more than we do the actual event. And it's easy to get caught up in that. We get so excited about the pageantry. And I love the pageantry. I do. I love the celebration. I love the programs. I love the colors. I love the videos. I love all of it. But at its core, we must come back to what the most basic thing is that separates what we believe from all the rest of the world. You say, what is that? It's the resurrection. I mean, the truth is, uh, without the resurrection, we do not have Christianity. Without the resurrection, we do not have what we really believe, okay? Because we can't. It's impossible without the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, here's the difference between real Christianity, and the religions of the world. All the religions of the world. And they don't all believe in Jesus. They don't all believe in Yahweh as God. 
They all believe that, but they all do this without exception. Every one without exception. What they do is they say, if you're good enough, if you try hard enough, if you put forth enough effort, if you'll reach up toward God, then maybe, maybe God might like you a little bit. Maybe he might, if he's in a good mood, let you into heaven. You don't know for sure. You're kind of rolling the dice, but maybe, just maybe, if you try hard enough and if you are good enough little boy or little girl, then you'll go to heaven when you die. All, without exception, all religions of the world, apart from Christianity, real Christianity, they begin with man reaching to God. The difference between Christianity and all the religions of the world, and I'm talking about true Christianity, I'm not, not talking about earning your way, not keeping the Ten Commandments to go to heaven, even though you may believe in Jesus, you may believe he's the Son of God, you may even believe that he resurrected from the grave, but all real Christians understand that Christianity is different in, the, in this, that it does not begin with you reaching to God. It does not begin with you being a good boy or a good girl. It begins with God reaching down to where you are. God reaching down that in your sin, in your poverty, in your need, God loves you. We were talking about this this past week about the fact that God knows you more than anyone. He knows you better than anyone, and yet he loves you more than anyone else. And God's magnificence, yes, he created the universe. I love in Genesis how it describes how God spoke everything into existence. And I love this. It, it says this. He created the stars also. As if that's like an after fact. As if that was so easy for God. that Oh, but just by the way, he also created the stars. Now, so... Um, I lost my train of thought. All right, so, um, so what, uh, what we're seeing is that God in his greatness, God in his love, God in how he reaches toward us, what he does is he thinks about us. You know, the Bible says in Psalms that God's number of thoughts toward us is greater than the number of the grains of sand on the seashore. So I know sometimes we're like, oh, well, God's too busy. God doesn't, he's busy running the universe. You ever heard that or thought that? Well, the simple thing is this. God loves you. He thinks more about you than you even think about yourself. He knows more about you than you know about yourself. He knows the number of hairs on your head at all times. And yet he loves you. So we want to keep it simple. I'm going to read the shortest depiction in the Gospels of the resurrection. Mark chapter 16. It's only seven verses. Let me begin reading in verse 1. Saturday evening when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. So what they did in that day, they'd bury a person, they'd come back and they'd put spices for the smell, for the anointing of the body, and very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. And on the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled aside. They were astonished. They were amazed. And when they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And the women were shocked. But the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. Now go and tell his disciples, including Peter, that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there just as he told you before he died. Today, I want to answer the question, what's the big deal about the resurrection? Why is it so important? Why is it so central to what we believe? Why is it what matters most? You see, sometimes we make it confusing. 
Preachers can do that. Leaders can do that. We make it about a lot of things that it's not really about. We're talking about with the church and about a relationship with God. And so I want to come back to the very core. Why the resurrection is so important to us and to what we believe. Here's the first thought. The resurrection is indispensable. It's indispensable for our salvation. In other words, without the resurrection, we have no hope. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. So what we talk about, what we teach, what you believe, pointless, in vain. It has no real meaning without the resurrection. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. So in other words, without the resurrection... There's no forgiveness of sins. There's no being made right with God. There's no going to heaven when you die. He says, apart from the resurrection, you don't get any of that. And then he goes on and, I mean, he drills down on this, okay? He said, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So get the point. There's no hope in death. There's no hope uh, for forgiveness. There's no hope for redemption. There's no hope for the love of God. There is no hope apart from the resurrection. Then he goes even further. He says, it is in, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So, I mean, he covers the bases, doesn't he? He says, there's no hope of forgiveness. What you believe, your faith is in vain. There's no hope in death. There's no hope in life. He says, even if you say that Jesus didn't raise from the dead, then all you've got is a religious belief. And he's pretty clear here that a religious belief is not what changes you, but it is the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, the resurrection is necessary for our salvation. It is central to our faith, and it is essential to our hope. Without the resurrection, he says, there is no hope. And, and as I think about that, you say, well, of course, without the resurrection, there's no hope for heaven. There's no hope for eternity. There's no hope in the afterlife. But you know, he's actually talking about not just that, but also this life. Can you imagine how hopeless it is to know that there is no possibility of forgiveness? That there is no possibility of redemption? That there is no possibility of life getting better? There's no hope. The resurrection is indispensable. We cannot do without it. It is necessary for our salvation. Here's a second thought. The resurrection is individual. It's indispensable, but it's also individual. In other words, it's about your story. Now, truthfully, all the gospel is about the story of God, but he includes us in this story to the point that it doesn't matter if you know somebody that has this story, that has salvation. you got to experience it yourself. I love what he said. He said, now go tell his disciples, including Peter. Why would he say that? Because just three days before, Peter denied Jesus. He failed. And Jesus, the angel, was letting him know, there's hope for you. There's forgiveness there's a second chance, and aren't you glad that God is a God of second chances? Man, he gives us hope. And by the way, I love this in that it's individual. Do you get the idea that Jesus wasn't just making the broad blanket statement, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life? Yeah, that's good. That's great. And we believe that God loves the world, do we not? We believe that God loves everyone, do we not? But here's the point. Until you believe that it applies to you, it makes no difference. I don't know if you ever have been in one of these churches 
that has pews, the old wooden pews. Uh, I've seen it a lot in old Baptist churches, and I've seen it a lot in old Methodist churches where they'll have a pew, and there's a little brass plaque on the very end. You may have wondered what that was. Weird thing to have a little plaque on the end of a pew, and it's got somebody's name engraved on it, or in memory of, or whatever. And, and, and what that is, is that there was somebody that went to that church, and they gave the money to buy that pew. That's why their name is on the end of the pew. And look, you may have had your grandmothers, both your grandmothers and all your great-grandmothers may have been so faithful in church that they had their own plaque on their own pew, okay? And, and you could say, well, my grandma was a great Christian. My mama was a great Christian, and that's wonderful, but it doesn't matter when you stand before God. God's not going to ask how many plaques did y'all have down at the Methodist church, He's not going to ask, how many pews did you buy? He's not going to say, did you get a brick when you donated to the building campaign and it's got your name on it? He's not going to ask that. Because the fact is, it doesn't matter. Oh, it matters to them. But your grandma can be the greatest Christian in the world. Your mom could have loved Jesus more than any other person on the planet. But it is individual in that It must apply to your relationship with God. That's the question. Do you know? Have you received? Have you become a follower of Jesus Christ? Do you have that personal relationship with him? You see, if you don't, then all of this is for naught. But the resurrection, it is an indispensable thing. Important for our salvation. It is individual. Without it, you don't go to heaven. Without it, you're not redeemed. Without it, you're not forgiven. But it is available to you. What you do with it is up to you. And then I want you to see that the resurrection is indiscriminate. You say, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't matter what your status is. I love little nuances in scripture that tell us a story. I don't know if you noticed, but in the resurrection story, it mentions some names of women. Most likely, you know or have heard of one of them, but the others you maybe not have heard. You've read it before, but you don't know who they are. Let's look at them. Mary Magdalene, most of us have heard of her. She was a person that was a follower of Jesus, but before she was a follower of Jesus, she was a troubled woman. The Bible tells us that Jesus cast seven demons out of this woman. Some believe, and tradition even says, that she was a prostitute. We don't know if she was or not, but we have no doubt that this woman had a sordid past. She had a painful past. Can you imagine the shame that was brought on her by being a demon-possessed person? Can you imagine the emotional turmoil? Well, we know about her, but what about these others? Who's Mary, the mother of James? This is not... Mary, the mother of Jesus, okay? This is perhaps a a relative, maybe a cousin. We don't know. And then there's Salome. We don't know that much about her. Why would then this be recorded in the gospel of Mark? Why? Well, I believe it tells us a very important story. The truth is that Your past, in other words, the gospel is indiscriminate. It applies to all. You say, well, I've got a bad past. Well, so did Mary Magdalene. Well, I've done a lot of things wrong. Well, are you demon-possessed by seven demons? The point is this. It doesn't matter what your past is. Even if you said something like this before, well, if I were to go into that church, the roof would fall in because, you know, you think, Your past is too much. And the point is this. It doesn't matter what your past is like. It doesn't matter if you failed. We've all failed. We've all sinned. It doesn't matter if you're very well known or not. Some of these women were not very well known. I did a lot of research trying to find out a little bit about them. There's not much on them. And so why were their names included in the gospel story? Because God wants you to know that the gospel applies 
to you, to you, to you. You see, the point is that Jesus, resurre- he died and resurrected for everyone, the famous and those that are not well known, the rich and the poor, the good and the bad. You see, the resurrection is for you. And that's what's so important about it. Today, I want to end with a simple prayer for you if you would like to follow Jesus as your Savior. You say, well, if you're watching online, maybe you're not sure. Maybe, maybe you watch normally. Maybe you don't watch very often. Maybe you just stumbled across this today and you've been watching. I want you to know that God loves you and there's a plan for your life and it is not an accident that you saw this today. Maybe in the room today there are some that you need to receive Christ. You know, I believe that there are a lot of people that think they're Christians. They're not. I'm going to be talking about this in a couple weeks. Um, Remember the story of the sower and the seed and the different kinds of soil? Well, that is instructive for us about our relationship with God. Are you one of those that's the quitter? When the sun gets hot, you quit. Are you one of those that maybe the cares and the pleasures and the riches of this world? Busyness, your work, your hobbies, your kids, your grandkids, whatever. It takes you away from that relationship with God? Well... There's room for everyone at the cross. That's what I want you to know. And so today, maybe you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help all of us to follow you with all of our hearts. Lord, I have no doubt that there are people here in the room, in both services today, that needed to hear this. There are people, no doubt, watching both live streams uh, that needed to hear this. And so, Lord, I pray that you draw them and convict them. Holy Spirit, work in their life. Before I finish my prayer with our heads bowed, maybe you'd like to pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God, and I believe you resurrected from the grave because you died in my place. And I receive you right now as my Savior. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask you to come into my life. Give me the faith to trust you. If you'll pray that prayer, I have utmost confidence that God will answer yes. He'll receive you if you'll ask. And so my prayer for you today is that you receive him online and in the room. Jesus, we thank you for what you do. Thank you for the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, I want everybody to grab your next step card, the little reddish color card. I've been corrected before and been told that's coral. That's not red. Um, how many think it's red? Raise your, if you, okay. All right. We'll go with red. All right. So, um, on the back, here's what I want you to do. Put your name. If you have any updated information, say for example, you've been a member here, or you've been coming here and you've got a new phone number or a new email, put that on there. But I want everybody to write your name, everybody write your name on it. And then today, we do this every year as a spiritual survey, just to test the spiritual waters here at our church. A, B, C, D, or E. I want you to write one of these letters. The letter A, I ask Jesus to be my Savior today. If today you pray to receive Christ, then you put the letter A. Very simple. Your name, letter A. Um, Maybe online, you do the same thing. You check at the bottom that you pray to receive Christ today. Uh, B, I'm not ready yet, but I'll think about it. This is for those of you that are not sure. You're not confident of your salvation, but you're thinking about it. You're not ready to make that commitment today. You put the letter B. The letter C, I've already been saved. I've already received Christ as my Savior. I'll put that on my card, the letter C, because I've been saved before today's services. I received Christ before today. Or D, And we're not kidding around when we say this. The letter D is, I'm not interested right now. 
okay? And we just want you to be honest about it because that'll help us to know how to pray for you. And then letter E, this is very important. I'm interested in taking my next step at church. I don't know if you've noticed this, but um, according to statistics and studies and people that do these things, whoever they are, um, did you know that less than 50% of people that went to church regularly, by regularly at least two or three times a month before the pandemic, you know that the attendance figures are now less than 50% of what it was. Now, I'm sure there are some exceptions, but this is true across the country. And maybe today you would say, you know what? I need to re-engage. I need to take my next step. Uh, your next step would be to start coming again. Or to begin to be faithful. Uh, Or maybe your next step is to get baptized. There are some that need to follow Christ in baptism. We'll baptize whenever we get scheduled. We've got a few people right now that are ready to get baptized and we're getting it scheduled. So maybe that's your next step. Maybe your next step is you want to join the church. Maybe your next step is you want to get involved. You've been coming but you've been kind of sitting on the sidelines. You've been like, yeah, this is wonderful and you're soaking it up. But you're not really involved in a way that a family member would be involved. And um, so we want to encourage you to take whatever your next step is. So you, if you're interested in doing that, put the letter E, all right? The letter E, all right? I think that's sufficient. Ushers, would you come? Uh, we're going to take our offering at this time as well. If you have offering to put in the bucket, you can put that in right now, all right? Now, let me explain to you how you can give here at Stillwater's Church. Obviously, you can give when the bucket passes. And so uh, whenever that passes, you can drop in offering if you'd like, okay? Now, how do most people give here at our church? Well, most people give in ways other than dropping it in the bucket. In fact, really, the only reason we pass buckets is for collecting cards and stuff like that because about 95, 96% of all of our giving comes in digitally, okay? Now, we did have one check melted into the office that we put in this week, but it's either, mostly it's digital. You can go to stillwaters.online, all right? Stillwaters.online, you can give online. Uh, You can set it up as recurring giving. You can go to the phone and text the number 84321, 84321. Pretty simple to remember. Put that in, you can give that way. Or you can download the Church Center app. That is where most of our giving happens. Kim and I give that way. And uh, I've got that app right here on my phone. I just tap it, and it allows me to go and give directly. It keeps um, records for you. You can follow the sermon notes, the small group notes, all kinds of benefits of getting the Church Center app. All right? So if you don't know how to do that, there's a little aqua teal kind of color card on the way out. You can grab it and it'll show you exactly how to do that. Okay. Okay. Thank you for being here today. Happy Easter to every one of you. I'm so excited about what God is doing in your life and in the life of our church. If you have questions, um, I'll be happy to hang out and talk with you. Uh, I love you. I'm so glad that you're here with us today. Now, next week, we'll have services at the same time, 9.30 and 11. So I hope you'll be able to come back and be with us next week. God bless you. Have a happy Easter. We'll see you next week.